resveratrol the mysterious molecule popularized by Dr. David Sinclair. If you exercise regularly, you put all the efforts, did you know that resveratrol can take away from you the benefits of your routine, of your exercise? We are going to weave in a few of Dr. David Sinclair discoveries, and we are about to expose how this mysterious molecule works and much more. Should you take, by the way, vitamin C and vitamin E? We are about to discover that today. By the end of this investigation, you will have life-changing insights into how our DNA works, what exercise does to your DNA to make you live longer, and where resveratrol fits here, and the perfect timing to take resveratrol for a lifelong habit of longevity and health. Welcome to the Wellness Messiah podcast. I'm your host, Riman. In the previous two episodes, we thought that we figured resveratrol, Take low doses and keep your body younger for much longer by silencing aging genes. Not too shabby for popping a pill. Yet resveratrol continues to puzzle and befuddle. These two studies uncover something that we never expected from resveratrol. Both of these studies measure the impact of resveratrol on exercise in humans. The first study from 2013 is called Resveratrol Blunts the Positive Effects of Exercise Training on Cardiovascular Health in Aged Men. Performance in up-and-go tests was increased in the placebo group only, meaning only exercise. Specifically, resveratrol supplementation combined with training abolished the reduction in blood pressure and in blood lipids and led to significantly lower increase in the training-induced increase in maximal oxygen uptake. In other words, resveratrol coupled with exercise, offset the performance improvement in exercise. But that's not everything. The researchers, a year later, conducted another study. In this study, they replicated the same conditions with resveratrol and exercise, and they measured two longevity markers, inflammation and antioxidant defense, both markers of aging. We want inflammation to go down. This is done by measuring tumor necrosis factor. And we also want the oxidation level to go down, because if the oxidation level goes down, it suggests an activation of the natural antioxidant system. And this they measured by protein carbonylation, which is a type of oxidized protein. The study is called Exercise Training, but not resveratrol, improves metabolic and inflammatory status in skeletal muscles of aged men. So this is what they found. The protein carbonylation level in skeletal muscles was evaluated as a marker of oxidative stress. Exercise training decreased protein carbonyl levels by 20%, and exercise training decreased TNF-alpha, which is a marker of inflammation, by 40%. This is terrific for longevity. Notably, however, resveratrol blunted an exercise training-induced decrease in protein carbonylation and decreased 40% in tumor necrosis factor, meaning inflammation. So it seems that in humans, both of these studies, resveratrol combined with exercise prevent both some of the performance gains and the reduction in inflammation and oxidative stress protection. What's going on here? How is it even possible that a supplement that keeps your body young also simultaneously hurts your exercise benefits? But that's not all the mystery behind this molecule. Do you remember the my study from 2008 that I covered on episode 1? The name of the study is Low-Dose Dietary Resveratrol Partially Mimics Caloric Restriction and Retards Aging Parameters in Mice. So in this study, they actually show that resveratrol activates longevity genes and silences aging genes. This is terrific for longevity. But the researcher also, when they sacrificed the mice, they operated the heart and the brain of these mice. And these mice took resveratrol every day during this study. Let's see what they found. To test if resveratrol has an impact of spontaneous oxidative damage, we measured a marker of lipid peroxidation, meaning oxidation, in the heart, skeleton muscle, and the brain. Surprisingly, we found that resveratrol significantly raised the level of this oxidation rate in the heart relative to controls, meaning it was worse off than just the regular diet. And another oxidation marker in the brain was higher in resveratrol-treated mice compared to caloric restriction mice. Did you see how they were surprised? Let me repeat what they found. They show that chronic resveratrol, despite activating all those longevity genes and enzymes, increased fat oxidation in the brain and in the heart. And the fat oxidation in the heart was even worse than mice on regular, not particularly healthy diet. 
Here again, similarly to exercise studies in humans, again, it increased oxidation in our bodies. Resveratrol messes with the oxidation system in our bodies. This is not good for longevity. But it doesn't make any sense because we have seen that resveratrol activates antioxidant defenses and also it's an antioxidant. How could an antioxidant increase oxidative stress in our bodies? And most importantly, how can you prevent this from happening in your body if you take resveratrol? For that, let's first define what is oxidation, what is antioxidant. From there, we are going to investigate this mystery to figure out what the heck is going on here. What is oxidation? Oxidation is a process where oxygen or other molecule steal an electron. The important thing to remember in this process, in this chemical process, is that oxidation changes the structure of the molecules inside your body. Your body actually can use that to kill bacteria or even cancer cells, but most of the time you don't want this process to happen because this is changes the function of the healthy tissues in your body. And we don't want active beneficial molecules, biological active molecules, to be changed and be transformed by oxidation. It's very similar to oxygen changes the structure of iron. This is exactly what you notice when you see a rusty iron. The oxidation changes the structure of the metal. There is a transformation that takes place in the metal, and it also happens in your body. This process can even increase inflammation, and we know that inflammation is not good for longevity. And generally speaking, we don't want to change. If we want to live longer, we want to freeze time. So we don't want unnecessary excess oxidation to take place within our body. We don't want to change. So this is oxidation. And an antioxidant is a molecule that counteracts this effect and protects the tissues from this change, from this oxidation. Fundamentally, an antioxidant sacrifices itself, almost like a sacrificial lamb, and neutralizes this way the offender, the things that can oxidize our bodies, such as radiation. This protective process leaves our body's tissues without damage, and they won't change. So far, we covered one secret of resveratrol, how it works differently, sometimes oppositely, in different doses. And we have seen, to me, beyond any reasonable doubt, that low resveratrol is actually better for longevity in everyday use. But believe it or not, there are still two more secrets that we haven't covered about this mysterious molecule. The second secret of resveratrol that besides activating those longevity genes and the impact on senescent cells, it also has a different, separate, discrete property. And this property has a grave consequences on when to take the supplement, and more importantly, when not to take that. Resveratrol's second activity is being an antioxidant. This is a different property that has nothing to do to what we covered so far. Why have plants bestowed resveratrol with this antioxidant power? Plants are stuck in the ground against the sun's radiation. When they are under stress, this antioxidant power helps the plants survive in addition to the longevity genes and enzymes activation by resveratrol. This is very good for the plant's longevity. But you and I, humans, we have a robust internal antioxidant defense system. And we are not stuck in the ground. Our needs are different from plants. And most of the time, we don't need these external antioxidants from plants. Let's hear Dr. David Sinclair explains how this really a different property of resveratrol. When I worked on resveratrol as a longevity molecule, first we showed it in yeast and worms and flies and mice. Uh, before that, it was thought that resveratrol was good for your heart in red wine when you drink red wine because it's an antioxidant. So then we showed that it extended the lifespan of yeast cells through this um, genetic pathway, the sirtuins. And we then tested whether resveratrol, if we changed one atom to make it not an antioxidant, guess what? It still worked fine. So it wasn't its antioxidant activity that was extending lifespan. It was its ability to turn on the yeast's defenses against aging. Conversely, when we gave the yeast antioxidants, they lived shorter. So yeah, that was the beginning of my mm -hmm. transformation into thinking, turn on the body's defenses, don't give it the antioxidant. So Dr. David Sinclair found that yeast, when they were giving antioxidant, lived shorter. But besides yeast, also in Sinclair's own lab, he found that giving worms antioxidants reduces their longevity. And I found this phenomena over and over in my research as well. In this study, the researchers took worms and they gave them chemicals that simulated low sugar nutrition. 
they measure the natural antioxidant defense. Then they give them antioxidants. Let's see what they found in the study. The study is called Glucose Restriction Extends Warm's Lifespan by Inducing Mitochondrial Respiration and Increasing Oxidative Stress. I'm quoting, we show here that reduced glucose availability promotes formation of reactive oxidant species, ROS. ROS, by the way, cause oxidation. This induces catalyst activity and increase oxidative stress resistance and survival rates, meaning it's increased longevity. So far, they found that reducing glucose actually increase our oxidative stress resistance and reduce mortality, increase survival. This is good for longevity. Then the researchers gave the worms antioxidants. Let's see what happens. Accordingly, treatment of nematodes, the, the worms, with different antioxidants and vitamins prevents extension of lifespan. In summary, these data questioning current widespread use of antioxidant supplements. So this supports what Dr. David Sinclair found, that giving yeast and worms external antioxidants actually reduces their lifespan and survival. But then you will say, that's cool, but these are just worms and yeast. Do we have supporting data in humans? This is an excellent question. So in 2007, they did a massive review studies of the use of antioxidants in humans. They took a massive amount of data that filtered the best 47 studies that has the lowest bias, meaning there was no intervention or influence or subsidies from nutritional supplements. And they tried to pinpoint the effect of different antioxidants and vitamins on mortality and longevity in humans. The study is called Mortality in Randomized Trials of Antioxidant Supplements for Primary and Secondary Prevention Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. Let's see what they found. In 47 low bias trials, the antioxidant supplements significantly increased mortality. Beta-carotene, vitamin A, and vitamin E, singly or combined, significantly increased mortality. Vitamin C and selenium had no significant effect on mortality. So here we have additional corroboration that taking antioxidants chronically increases mortality, meaning it hurts our longevity. So what happens here, really? Aren't antioxidants good for us? This phenomenon happens because when we take chronically external antioxidants, it can turn off the natural antioxidant system. It's plain laziness of our bodies and the DNA not producing something naturally when the environment providing us with this comfort. But in total, we are actually losing in this trade-off. These natural antioxidants our body produce are much more effective and actually much more specific and smart than what we consume from the outside. And if you need further corroboration for that, in this investigation, I showed you in 2008 my study that the researchers who gave low-dose resveratrol to mice chronically every day discovers something amazing. Resveratrol indeed achieved longevity activation, but when the researchers operated these mice, they surprised to discover that the mice had a higher oxidation rate in the brain and in the heart, suggesting the turning off of the natural antioxidant system of these mice. I know it's a segue, but let's return to the human study. Do you remember that the researcher found that selenium and vitamin C didn't have an impact on mortality? Why is that? Let's start with selenium. Selenium is a mineral. It's not an antioxidant per se. What it does, it helps glutathione peroxidase, which supports the natural antioxidant defense. So selenium can enhance the natural antioxidant defense system, but per se, it's not an antioxidant, which can explain the result. What about vitamin C? It's also an antioxidant, so why doesn't it increase mortality? Now, I have speculation. I suspect it's because vitamin C, it's a water-soluble antioxidant, which means that it doesn't penetrate easily into cells. So your body can get rid of it easily by peeing it out. This is not the same as vitamin E, vitamin A, beta-carotene, because these can be accumulated within tissues and cells, and the body cannot get rid of them, so they hang in the cell and can turn off this natural antioxidant defense system. Does it mean that taking vitamin C is good for you? Should you take vitamin C? Well, it depends on the situation. But here is an interesting thing. Do you know that humans and most monkeys are amongst the only mammals that do not produce vitamin C? It us and monkeys live the longest on average comparing to other mammals. But we are not the only mammal that cannot produce vitamin C. You know which mammal also cannot do that? Guinea pigs. 
If you had a pet guinea pig, you probably know that you must buy food with vitamin C. These animals, these pets, cannot make their own vitamin C. The rest of the rodents can. Yet guinea pigs live the longest among their family. They live an average of 5 to 7, even 8 years. This lifespan is much longer than many of the other small pets, such as hamsters, gerbils, mice, or rats, all of whom only live up to a few years, usually 2-3 years, max. Is that a coincidence? Frankly, I don't know, but this is why I'm not a big fan of taking vitamin C without a good reason, without a tactical goal, such as supporting the immune system when we are sick, for example. And all these studies about antioxidants are exactly why I've been always recommend my clients to avoid multivitamins and external antioxidants unless there is a tactical reason for them to take them. So, should everyone avoid antioxidant supplements? Not so quickly. Something interesting happens when we age. Let me read from this amazing study from 2011, then analyze it. The name of the study is Vitamin E may affect the life expectancy of men. Let's see what they found. Among all 10,837 participants, which is a large group of people, vitamin E had no effect on those who were between 65 to 70 years old, but reduced mortality by 24% when participants were 71 year old or older. So what happens here? Vitamin E suddenly at some point reduced mortality? It looks like we are contradicting what we have found before. What's going on in this situation? Let's think about it for one second. What happens for most people from age 65? I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about most of our population which have accelerated aging from age 65. So their natural antioxidant defense system, they begin to dwindle, they begin to break down. And what happens when you are age 65 to 70, your natural antioxidant is not on its peak performance. So when you take vitamin E, you actually cover some of the weakness of your natural antioxidant defense system, but you also probably a bit shut it down. Altogether, it makes no difference. Overall, you break even no impact on mortality. But then, what happens over age 71? Most people's natural antioxidant defense system really begins to collapse, and the downside of taking antioxidants externally is suddenly minimized because the system is weak to begin with, and vitamin E comes to the rescue and protects the fatty acids in your body and the fatty tissues from being oxidized and prevents runaway aging. So this is fascinating. As you can see, antioxidant supplements do have a role if you know how to use them. Sometimes they can be life-saving, and sometimes they can be life-taking. And maybe now, can you see why there is such a controversy about taking vitamins and antioxidant supplements? Why different studies can show different results and confuse all of us? And this is exactly why data interpretation is so important. As I said, Data interpretation, not data, means everything, and we have to correctly interpret data. Everything changes based on the dose, the situation, and the age. We have to be spot on. So far, we have found that we don't need external antioxidants when we are young. But what about our inner antioxidants? Do we need them? And what happens to our longevity when we activate this internal antioxidant system? This study gives us a glimpse. The study is called Extension of Murine Life by Overexpression of Catalase Targeted to Mitochondria. Murine are mice and rats. In this situation, the study was done on mice. And here, they took mice and forced their antioxidant genes to be active more than usual. They overexpressed the gene. So they activated even more than usual the natural antioxidant defense system. What happened to the longevity of the mice? I'm quoting, median and maximum lifespan were maximally increased averages of five months and 5.5 months respectively in MCAT animals in these mice. So it's about 20% increase both in the average lifespan, which is the median, and the maximum lifespan. It's a big difference in longevity for one simple change. And that's not everything they found. I'm quoting, cardiac pathology and cataract development were delayed. Oxidative damage was reduced. 
and the development of mitochondrial deletion was reduced. So what does it mean? Not only did these mice live longer, on average and in maximum lifespan, they also were healthier all throughout. So it looks like activating the natural antioxidant defense in mice and probably in our bodies as well makes us healthier and live longer. This is exactly what we want. Now comes the question, what can you do today to activate your natural antioxidant defense system? As we have seen with the worms, reducing sugar. I can tell you it works in humans as well. Reducing sugar activates the natural antioxidant defense system. The second thing that we can do, which is even more relevant to our discussion, is doing intense exercise. Intense exercise activates the natural antioxidant defense system. And here we are closely, closely getting back to the original research we have seen today about resveratrol in exercise. Maybe this is going to give us a clue to what the heck happened in the two studies. Now, to continue in this investigation, we need to understand the exact mechanism by which exercise activates our natural antioxidant defense system. One way exercise works for longevity is by increasing oxidative stress meaning the generation of free radicals. Let's hear Dr. David Sinclair explain this concept for longevity. There's a reason why vigorous exercise is so important beyond just, just walking and standing. It's that you have hypoxia. Low levels of oxygen are undoubtedly good for you. But what also happens is you get free radicals generated. Now, if you don't have enough oxygen, then that'll lead to these free radicals being produced and it'll damage the cell. So you might say, well, that makes no sense. If you're running and you're damaging the cell, it's going to be bad, right? But remember, a little bit of damage can be good. So what happens is it stimulates what's called mitohormesis, mitochondrial hormesis. And that has a whole variety of benefits as well, including the manufacture of more mitochondria that gives you energy. This requires explanation. One of the fundamental ways of how exercise works for our longevity is by exposing our bodies to oxidative stress. This is good because it makes your body stronger after the exercise. You get high oxidative stress for 30 minutes, but you are protected for one, two weeks. Sounds like a good trade. So if exercise works by increasing short-term oxidation stress and free radicals, what happens when you take external antioxidants before your exercise? not just resveratrol, any antioxidants. This review study from 2016 has a clue. It's called Dietary Antioxidants as Modifiers of Physiologic Adaptations to Exercise. I'm quoting, Gomez and Cabra, these are researchers they refer to, suggested that vitamin C supplementation during endurance training blunts one of the mitochondrial biogenesis paths. This path is exactly what Dr. David Sinclair spoke about as pro-longevity. Additionally, they spoke about a different study. Endurance training combined with vitamin C supplementation in rats blunted an improvement in running time in comparison with training alone. 26% improvement versus 186% improvement, respectively. This is a huge difference in improvement. And this is reminiscent of what happened in a resveratrol study, where the performance gains reduced. So what happens here, really? You don't want external antioxidants in your muscles when you exercise. You want this stress. You don't want anything to negate that stress. However, as we said, resveratrol is also an antioxidant. And we certainly know that resveratrol penetrates the muscles when you take it, potentially negating the benefits of this effort. And maybe this could explain the studies we have seen in the beginning where resveratrol offset the exercise benefits. Let's go back to the two studies I've showed you in the beginning of this video. Let's revisit the two studies I've shown you in the beginning of this video. We need to figure two things. One, when was resveratrol taken? If it was prior to the exercise, it's a recipe for disaster. And another question we need to figure out, was the exercise intense? We need to answer this question because the more intense the exercise is, the more beneficial generation of free radicals takes place and the more resveratrol antioxidant capacity can sabotage the effort of the exercise. So this is the first study. Let's see what they did. All subjects performed eight weeks of supervised high-intensity interval training twice a week and full-body circuit training CrossFit once a week. In addition, subject conducted five-kilometer walk once a week. Now, these people, they didn't exercise regularly prior to the study. For me, 
5 kilometers walk for people who don't exercise is high intensity. So what do we have here? High intensity interval training twice a week, CrossFit, which is intense, and 5 kilometer walk. In total, in my book, it's 4 times a week high intensity exercise. So we have one check for the second question. About the first question, when was resveratrol given? So first, we can see they gave them 250 milligrams of resveratrol per day. Transresveratrol is resveratrol. Then they said the subject were instructed to take their daily tablet at the same time every morning. Every morning. As I'm going to show you, resveratrol is very active in your system for at least 9 hours, probably more. So taking resveratrol in the morning and having the exercise during the day is guaranteed to make sure that resveratrol was in the muscles while these people exercised. These indeed offset exercise benefits. Check mark number 2. Before we're going to move to the other study, an interesting thing they found in this study, I'm quoting, the observed effects were not related to change in CERT1. Why is this interesting? Because this supports what Dr. Siclair found, that CERT1 and being an antioxidant are two different aspects of resveratrol. They are not connected to one another, so you could have the activation of these longevity genes, but also the antioxidant effect. Now let's move to the 2014 study. The exercise training intervention consists of supervised high intensity interval spinning training twice per week, full body circuit training once per week. In addition, the subject were instructed to walk five kilometers once per week. So again, it's the exact same exercise protocol, four high intensity exercises every week. And all participants were instructed to take one tablet each morning. So in essence, they replicated the same study, but this time they measured inflammation and natural antioxidant defense activation. And we have seen in both of these measurements, resveratrol abolished the benefits when taking prior to exercise. So there you have it. What can we conclude from that? We must take refresh time between taking resveratrol to our next intense exercise. How long should you avoid resveratrol prior to your exercise? We are going to investigate this today. As we transition into the practical steps of today, let's summarize all the insights that we gathered so far. This is important because we gathered insights today that are overreaching beyond just taking resveratrol. So this is what we found. Antioxidants buffer oxidative stress. Two, the key for longevity is the activation of the inner antioxidant system in our bodies, not taking external antioxidants from plants. So in our minds, we want to separate our natural antioxidant system from the external antioxidants produced by plants. Next, high-intensity exercise activates this inner antioxidant system by creating short-term oxidative stress and free radicals. Another tool to do that is reducing our sugar intake, which also activates this system. Then we found that exercising while having external antioxidants in our blood, in our muscles, while we exercise, can eliminate the exercise benefits, both performance gains and longevity benefits, by counteracting the oxidative stress that produced by this very exercise. We also learned that while plants produce antioxidants to make them resistant against radiation, these, in our bodies, can turn off our natural antioxidant system. And this external supplementation could increase mortality, especially under age 70. There is a role for antioxidants over the age of 70. Then we learned that resveratrol is a plant molecule that has two separate activities, silencing aging genes and antioxidant. The first is excellent for us. The second is mostly unwanted and should be minimized, especially that is proven to penetrate our muscles, which can affect our exercise performance. So what do we do? By controlling our timing of taking resveratrol, we can minimize resveratrol antioxidant capacity, both for our longevity and for exercise benefits and performance, all while enjoying resveratrol longevity gene activation and the silencing of aging genes, Scott free This way, we're going to eat the cake and have it too. We're going to reap all the benefits from taking a simple supplement without counteracting our other longevity habits and exercise. So what exactly should we do to achieve this goal? I'm going to give you now three ways as general solutions and four simple steps, very quick easy steps or quick easy habits that implement everything that we learned today. All these will enhance your longevity routine. As we transition into the practical part with the habits and the supplement routine, we have to acknowledge the truth. 
it's difficult for everyone to stick with the habits that I give for health and longevity, even for me. It's a real pain. Knowing what to do is not enough. And because of that, I've arranged a deal with an app that specialized in exactly this problem. How to implement habits easily and how to stick to them months and even years after that. In that deal, you'll get the app plus a special bonus from me relating to my entire supplement routine. To try it yourself and see if it works for you, go to wellnessmessiah.com forward slash app. wellnessmessiah.com forward slash app. Granted, if we compare the great benefit of resveratrol by the activation of those anti-aging enzymes and genes, this is a small downside. Yet it's a downside that we want to minimize. How can we minimize it? There are three ways to do so. The first way is to take time off of resveratrol. This applies also to other polyphenols. We can cycle them. We don't have to take resveratrol every single day. And Sinclair found that himself as well. Let's hear him speaking about that in his study. If we gave it to mice their whole lifespan, they were protected against a high-fat diet, which we call the Western diet. They had lean organs. They live slightly longer, but not a lot. This is what's not known, though it's in the supplemental data of the paper that nobody ever reads. The mice that were given resveratrol every second day on a normal diet live dramatically longer than any other group. So people out there, you know, my, my critics say, oh, resveratrol didn't extend the lifespan of mice on a normal diet, therefore it's not aging, it's just protecting against a high fat diet. Well, look at the supplemental data, please. If you give it to, to the mice every other day, we had mice living over three years. And what that told me is that probably you don't want to be taking a supplement every day. You can take it either every other day or give your body a rest. So cycling with Viratrol has led to the greatest improvement in longevity in mice. This is, in fact, the only study that measured taking resveratrol in cycles. Even though it's a single study, that's the only study that we have seen where resveratrol increases maximum lifespan in a healthy body, in a healthy animal. Is that a coincidence? I think not. I don't think what Sinclair found is a coincidence. Now, since we only have one single data, let's use logic now. So there are two main reasons why I believe it's useful to take time off resveratrol and not take it every day for longevity. The first reason is that in our investigation, we have found that low-dose resveratrol helps cells to survive. Resveratrol actually helps senescent cells to be rejuvenated, they live longer, and low-dose resveratrol helps cells to stay younger and stick around for much longer. This is great for longevity. However, you do want to give your body some time to get rid of renegade cells, specifically cancer and senescent cells. You don't want them to survive. And resveratrol, with its preservation impact, can get in the way of this very healthy process. By taking a few days off resveratrol every week, your body has the chance to remove those cells without the intervention of resveratrol. The second reason to take time off resveratrol supplementation is its antioxidant properties, which is completely separate property from its ability to activate longevity genes and turn off aging genes. This is the exact phenomenon that we've covered. So by taking time off resveratrol, you get this longevity activation, but you have days without antioxidants circling in your tissues. And this way you can keep the natural inner internal antioxidant system on its toes, meaning it stays strong. Both of those reasons to take time off resveratrol could explain what Dr. David Sinclair found in his study about the value of resveratrol cycling. There is one situation where I would not personally cycle or take time off resveratrol. If my diet is McDonald's-based nutrition, where we know these meals turn on the aging genes, if I eat those meals every day, I want resveratrol to be there with every meal, every time. Sure, I'll lose some from chronic supplementation of resveratrol, but I will gain much more from resveratrol's chronic aging protection. This is exactly why the obese mice in Dr. David Sinclair's study and others, when they were fed a resveratrol every single day, it was still very effective without cycling. So these obese mice, whom you can say are the parallel of humans on bad diets, actually benefited a lot from resveratrol. In other words, if I eat processed food every day and I'm overweight, it's better to take resveratrol every day with unhealthy meals. 
I guess this is not your case. And if you do eat a healthy diet, like I know that you are, and apply longevity strategies like the ones that we show in this channel, I would take time off resveratrol. The second way to minimize this downside is that we want to time our exercise properly. Take resveratrol after exercise, not before. The third way to minimize resveratrol antioxidant side effect is, what a surprise, taking lower dose of this supplement. Exactly what we found so far in this investigation is because resveratrol antioxidant power has directly to do with how much we take of it. Lower dose resveratrol has a lower antioxidant power, therefore it's safer in long-term consumption in healthy people. In essence, we get most of the longevity activation without consuming excessive, unnecessary external antioxidant power. As opposed to that, when we take high dose resveratrol, we may be receiving more antioxidant power, more external antioxidant power, which we may not really need. We don't need excessive antioxidants coming from high dose resveratrol. So there you have it. Another problem that we found with high dose resveratrol, taken chronically for healthy people. Now let's do a summary of those problems. I want to summarize three problems with taking high dose resveratrol chronically in healthy people. High dose resveratrol pushing cells to death over helping them to survive. Not good in everyday use and it won't help us to live longer. High dose resveratrol also removes the rejuvenation of senescent cells. This is not good for your longevity. And three, high dose resveratrol is a stronger fat soluble antioxidant, which can turn off antioxidant defense system. This is not good, again, for your longevity. We only want the activation of this natural internal antioxidants, and all these together can explain why high doses of resveratrol in Sinclair studies and also other studies, also cancer studies and senescent cell studies and even human studies analysis, we lose many of the longevity benefits. I hope it makes sense to you. Let's cover the four easy steps or easy habits that will maximize resveratrol's benefits and minimize its side effects based on everything we discovered today. So when you exercise, your body, especially your muscles, generate free radicals, which create oxidative stress. But you don't want, within this process, external consumed antioxidants in your muscles when you exercise. However, as we said, resveratrol is also an antioxidant. And resveratrol undoubtedly will target your muscles, potentially negating the benefits of this effort. Therefore, it's better to take resveratrol after exercise and not before intense exercise. I'm often asked whether doing simple walks considered this type of exercise. And I say no. I refer here only to intense exercise, where, you know, the heart rate is going up, where it's difficult to breathe. A very brisk walk, running, spinning, intense weight training, all of these will increase the oxidative damage by exercise, which actually promotes longevity. Now comes the question, how long should you wait after you take resveratrol and in your next exercise routine? This study found that it takes 9 to 10 hours for the body to eliminate half of the resveratrol metabolites. We simply pee it out. A total of 5 distinct metabolites of resveratrol have been reported in urine samples, with a half-life of 9.2 hours. Note that this is the half-life, meaning half of the metabolites are still in the system at this point. It would be safe to say that within 24 hours, you don't have resveratrol anymore in your body. And we can conclude that definitely 24 hours before intense exercise is a good time to skip taking resveratrol. There is another great time to avoid taking resveratrol, which leads me to the next habit. Many people in our longevity community, from time to time, do water fasting, which is a fantastic strategy for longevity. And full day fasting with water is probably one of the best times to skip resveratrol. But why? Let's go to the basics. We found in our investigation that resveratrol works mainly by silencing aging genes and activating longevity genes and enzymes. When you fast, there are no meals to turn on these aging genes. We don't need resveratrol when we fast. It doesn't add anything to our results here, really. In addition, fasting puts what I call death pressure. Fasting puts pressure inside our bodies on eliminating dangerous cells, such as cancer and senescent cells. But resveratrol helps cells to survive and live longer. We don't want resveratrol to get in the way of this elimination. And I showed you in our investigation that resveratrol indeed can get in the way of doing that. 
So this is another reason why we want to skip resveratrol when we fast. The third reason why we want to skip resveratrol during those days is simply the absorption of resveratrol. Resveratrol best absorbed with a fatty meal and alcohol, and we avoid both of these during fasting. And taking resveratrol and empty stomach is going to reduce its absorption. So you're going to get less of it into your system. In fact, you're not going to be sure how much exactly your body receives. So the bottom line is this. One of the most opportune time to take time off resveratrol is when we fast. Now, this is complete fasting. What about taking it during intermittent fasting, specifically during the fasting window? There is another reason why we don't want to take resveratrol with the tiny, tiny bit of meal when we fast during intermittent fasting. This is not the most opportune time. What do I do? Personally, I do intermittent fasting in the morning. This fasting already turns off the aging genes. I don't need resveratrol to be there. And definitely, I don't need to eat anything special to take resveratrol with it. I don't want to eat anything in the morning that may interfere with my fasting in order to improve the absorption of resveratrol. It doesn't make any sense. So instead, I take resveratrol in the evening with a meal and, of course, after exercise. At this point, I gave you two ideas about when to skip resveratrol. But in days that we do take resveratrol, which is the most opportune time to maximize its longevity benefits? This leads us to the next habit. Now let me explain to you that because this is really important, so listen to this. Here again we go back to what resveratrol does. It silences aging genes. When do we need resveratrol to do that the most? When we do things that turn on aging genes. What are those things? Eating junk food, eating sugary snacks, and eating a very large meal, especially high in carbs mixed with fat and sugar. This will do it. It will activate aging genes. We know that. And the more carbs mixed with fat, the higher the risk of the meal to activate those aging genes. And believe it or not, this activation of aging genes can happen within the hour, immediately after the meal. Now think about this. In Dr. David Sinclair's study, the mice fasted for one day and ate in another. And they had resveratrol mixed into their food. So it was every other day resveratrol together with every other day food. And these mice lived the longest. Now think about this point. When the mice fasted, they did not need resveratrol. The following day, they overindulged in food. When the mice ate after the fasting day, they ate a massive amount of food. Actually, they consumed almost double what a normal mouse eats. This is exactly where there was excessive meals turn on the aging genes, turn off longevity. But resveratrol was in the right place and in the right time to turn those aging genes off. This way, it extended the lifespan of these animals. It both reduced mortality pretty significantly. Also, it added more than 2%, 2.5% to the maximum lifespan of these mice. So what all of that tells us? When we eat the largest meal of the day, or especially the, the most unhealthy meal of the day, this is when we need resveratrol the most, to keep those aging genes off. This is where resveratrol shines. So let it shine. It's worth noting that usually most of us, we love to eat large meals to compensate after intense exercise. It also helps with recovery from the exercise. And by taking resveratrol after the exercise with the large meal, you improve the absorption of resveratrol and you actually time resveratrol perfectly, both avoiding negating the benefits of exercise, but also taking it with a meal that have the chance to activate aging genes. However, all this discussion about when to take resveratrol brings up another interesting question. You may have heard that we need to take resveratrol in the morning because it's good for the internal clock, the circadian rhythm, especially when we take it together with NMN in the morning. Is that true? Do we need to take resveratrol in the morning? So many subscribers ask me about the importance of taking resveratrol in the morning, right in the morning, together with one gram of NMN, exactly what Dr. David Sinclair does. Let's analyze this carefully. Why does Dr. David Sinclair take NMN in the morning. NMN increases NAD levels in the blood, and these NAD levels, they cycle up and down throughout the day. And Sinclair tries to uh, time this cycling with taking NMN, so he gets the natural movement of NAD levels synchronized with the internal clock of the circadian rhythm. So far, it makes sense for NMN, not for resveratrol. 
any man increases NAD directly. Resveratrol doesn't. Resveratrol doesn't affect NAD cycle at all as far as I know. So what resveratrol does? It activates a bunch of stress enzymes such as SIRT1 and turn off aging genes. Now these genes, and especially those longevity enzymes, they need to work all day long. So to me it's much better to anchor resveratrol with meals. Lunch, dinner, it doesn't matter. And, and please don't eat in order to take resveratrol. Complete fasting is good for you. Anchor resveratrol with meals that you already eat. This way you're gonna hit two birds with one stone, improve absorption, and also you're gonna silence the aging genes that potentially could be activated by the meal. What do I do? Well, I only eat one large meal a day, and sometimes not even that, so I take resveratrol once a day, four times a week. And if I have the opportunity to drink red wine, I use that opportunity. So this is simple for me, and I can spare my attention to focus on other longevity habits and supplements. There is more to life and more to longevity besides taking resveratrol supplements. This leads me probably to the coolest habit in this list. Listen, there is no substitute to a healthy diet on a regular everyday lifestyle. And you know that what you eat most of the time matters the most. Excursions, a double meaning by the way, will happen and there is no judgment against that. When we go on vacations, staying in a hotel, we will stray a bit off our regular healthy diets. And truth to be told, cheap fats, high carbs, and unnecessary sugars in our salad dressings are hard to avoid in those uh, situations. These ingredients, sometimes outside of our control, can turn off longevity enzymes and turn on the aging genes. We want to keep those aging genes silent. This is when we need resveratrol the most, despite eating that super tasty meal on our holiday or vacation. And I think here resveratrol can give us a bit of leeway. A few years back I've been on a pleasure cruise with my wife for 7 days and in hindsight I should have taken resveratrol every day, not every other day. This is what I would do and I think it's a solid habit to use. Taking the advantage of resveratrol's power in the specific time when we want to have a little fun. Again, not a substitute to a healthy diet, just the once in a while occasion that gives us some leeway in our lifestyle. So these were the four steps to maximize resveratrol benefits and minimize the side effects by timing it correctly. This way we avoid the mistakes that other people are making when they take resveratrol. Let's close everything we discovered so far, comparing high-dose resveratrol and low-dose resveratrol, and hence concluding when to use what, what dose is perfect for which situation. Low resveratrol creates low biological stress. It is used in plants to increase cell survival and cell longevity. High resveratrol activates high biological stress, which encourages cell death, apoptosis. Low-dose resveratrol is enough to prove activation of longevity genes and enzymes similar to caloric restriction. High resveratrol seems to have a strong anti-cancer activity, forcing cancer cells to commit suicide. Low resveratrol prevents healthy cells from becoming senescent. It helps to rejuvenate them, as opposed to high resveratrol, which actually induces senescence, and we actually lose the cell rejuvenation benefits. And lastly, low resveratrol has a weaker external antioxidant power which is good for everyday use, as opposed to high resveratrol, which has a stronger external antioxidant power. The verdict? Low resveratrol is good for everyday use for longevity, whereas high resveratrol is very good for acute use over ages 50 to 60 to remove dangerous cells from our bodies. In the next episode, we'll answer, does resveratrol interact with other supplements that you take? With other foods that you eat? This mysterious molecule can be combined to enhance its benefit, or not combined to avoid unnecessary issues with other supplements that you take. You'll see the newest research on that. I heard Dr. David Sinclair saying that polyphenols in olive oil are actually better than the ones in resveratrol. We are going to figure this out. In addition, we are about to take a deep dive into resveratrol absorption. So if you wonder, how do you maximize resveratrol's absorption, be ready again for some serious myth-busting. In the next episode, we will speak more and more about habits like today. And because it's difficult to implement habits for everyone, I'm giving you the top app that specializes in this exact problem. And a special bonus for me. In this app, you can find how to implement the habits easily and how to persist with them over the months and years ahead. Stick to the habits that you know are good for you. In that special deal with the app, you'll receive a bonus from me related to my supplement routine for free. Would you like to give it a try and see if it works for you?
If so, go to wellnessmessiah.com forward slash app. And until the next episode, remember, the correct data interpretation is everything.